We're here with David, uh, our Chief Scientific Officer, Dr. David Barron. I'm excited to bring this cool topic to you. Um, during the presentation, you can, two things, you can adjust the size of the things on your screen. So we have David on video. Um, he has under some objective objection agreed to be recorded today. I think um, we're trying a new thing with this. So you have him, but you also should have a screen that has our slides on it. And you can adjust the size of those two so you can see whichever one you'd like to see bigger. You can close one out, I think. So if you have any trouble, just send me a little note and we will, um, we'll, I'll help walk you through that while David is talking. Um, and so also you can send me your questions and comments in that chat Panel. You can also tweet it to us at, at PKD Foundation using hashtag Webinar Wednesday. Sarah is here with us and she will be happy to uh, hand any questions you have over to me and also will um, be tweeting throughout the afternoon. Um, we'll also have a Q&A at the end, so if you have questions, um, I may wait till the end to ask them. Um, note that the, P the PKD Foundation does not offer medical advice and the information shared this afternoon is not intended to be a substitute for consultations with your health professional. As always, care and treatment decisions related to your health must be made in consultation with your health professional team. Um, and, and please don't mistake any advice we give here as clinical advice that you should move forward with. Always talk with your doctor if you have questions. Um, we are recording this webinar and also video recording it um, and we'll archive it on our website within the next few days. Okay, today David is going to be talking about regenerative medicine. And I have to say of all our topics, this is one um, that I'm very excited about. It's a really cool topic. It's a very exciting area of study and although it's kind of still in the early stages, so we're, we're still learning a lot about this, it does give us a glimpse of what the future may hold for medicine and for treatments. So with that, I hand it over to you, David. Well, good morning and good afternoon, depending on your time zone. Uh, I hope you're more interested in the slides than my mug, but uh, uh, look at both if you wish. Uh, <laughs> this all started for me. I was uh, fortunate enough to be asked to participate in the National Academy of Sciences Forum on Regenerative Medicine last fall and I was on the renal panel. Uh, there were panels on, on CNS and the brain, the heart, and other organs. And uh, I'd like to talk to you about what I've learned uh, in the area of renal regenerative medicine. Try your space bar. I am frozen. Ah, there, there we go. go. So what is regenerative medicine? It's a branch of translational research. And what does translational mean? It means taking basic science uh, knowledge and translating it into the medical arena. Uh, this could be in the form of tissue engineering and molecular biology, uh, including genetics. And it deals with the process of replacing engineering or regenerating human cells, tissues, or even whole organs to restore or establish normal function. Now, I want to make it clear that this is not quite Frankenstein's monster, uh, that regeneration doesn't mean that you will see an exact replica of a normal human organ where there was a diseased human organ previously. But what it does mean is that you'll be able to establish normal function, if not necessarily normal structure. So that's the Wikipedia uh, explanation. The Mayo Clinic, which is active in regenerative medicine, uh, views it as a game-changing area of medicine. They've invested heavily in this, with the potential to fully heal damaged tissues and organs, offering solutions and hope for people who have conditions that to they are really beyond repair. Unfortunately, PKD is one of those conditions. And uh, the Mayo and other academic centers, as well as industry, are increasingly interested in the field of regenerative medicine. But we're in early days. So what does regeneration really mean? Actually, uh, I guess I learned about it without knowing that it was really the basis of what is now called regenerative medicine, and that in eighth grade I was playing uh, with this little 
worm that you see on the left side in the middle of the slide, this is a planarian uh, worm, and if you slice the worm's head in two, it will actually grow two new heads. If you take this worm and you slice it into 280 little pieces, each one of those 280 little pieces will ultimately grow back into a new planarian worm. And in a more advanced animal, such as a salamander, uh, this is really a defensive measure for salamanders. If a predator goes after a salamander and bites the tail, that predator may get the tail, but the salamander is long gone because they easily lose their tails to get away from predators. And the amazing thing about these salamanders, which are vertebrates, not little worm-like structures that these planarians are, uh, they can regenerate their tail, including the bones, the nerves, the skin, and the muscle. And really, in these two species, the planaria and the salamanders, are some of the basic secrets about regeneration. And many investigators are really working on these two animals and many others like them to get at the secrets of nature as to how uh, regeneration can occur. However, as you get farther along in complexity, in other words, mammals, regeneration is largely limited to um, certain tissues like the skin. Um, and even the skin, if it's more than a slight burn or a scratch, it doesn't really regenerate. It, it does heal, but it results in a scar. So, Unlike the planarian, which will regenerate back to a normal planarian, even the skin of a mammal, such as us, uh, if the damage is more than very superficial, you don't really get complete regeneration. So, as I mentioned, the human skin regenerates actually on a daily basis. You leave a trail of dead cells uh, at the shower in the morning or when you scratch or they just are shed off the surface, and they're constantly replaced by dividing and differentiating cells below the surface of your skin. And these are the stem cells, and they eventually become the flattened keratinocytes, as they're called, that actually provide the surface of your skin and allow you to be protected from the environment. Other tissues in the body, like the gut, actually regenerates on a regular basis. Uh, I don't have the time to really go into this, but gut cells, like other cells in the body that are metabolically active, uh, get tired, they die, and they get replaced. And it's on a very programmatic basis that this happens, so that uh, cells lining your intestines uh, every several weeks or so are basically replaced by new cells. Uh, other tissues like the brain uh, and neurons, they are incapable of this type of regeneration because as you can imagine some neurons may be three feet long and it's very difficult to see how they could actually divide and regenerate that three foot axon. So. Uh, the kidney uh, is a very complicated organ, but it does have some limited regenerative capacity. Uh, like the gut and the skin, skulls get old, or you may have a small stone that, that injures some of your kidney epithelia, and those cells can divide and replace those damaged cells. But in terms of replacing a whole nephron, uh, that has not been observed before, although Investigators are looking at ways that one can effectively replace a nephron, even if it isn't structurally identical to the native nephron. Oddly enough, the liver, which in many ways is a much simpler organ than the kidney, uh, has a high capacity for regeneration. And uh, there may be some of you in the audience that have actually donated a lobe of your liver. The reason you can do that is that the liver will regrow that lost uh, lobe, and you will end up within months with 
the same size liver you had before you donated that individual lobe. Unfortunately, the kidney and other organs don't have this kind of capacity. But like the planarian worm, like the salamander, people are studying why is it that the liver can regenerate in this way. So what are the current regenerative medicine options? I've given you sort of uh, the, the nature perspective of regenerative medicine, how the animals do it, and they do it in a wonderful way that's been uh, worked out over hundreds of millions of years of evolution. But in terms of current medical options, there's embryo selection, which is actually a state-of-the-art technique where one can take one of a 32-cell embryo and see if that cell contains the mutant PK gene or not. And if it does, then that embryo wouldn't be implanted. However, if an embryo didn't show the gene, and as many of you know, this is a 50-50 proposition, uh, that embryo could be implanted and one would be confident that that embryo would develop uh, into a human being without the PKD mutation. And many companies, big and small, in, in pharma are using strategies that have been developed for the treatment of diseases like cystic fibrosis to try to encourage uh, tissues like the kidney to regenerate. Not that they can grow a new tail, so to speak, like a salamander, but that they can rebuild nephrons that may have been damaged by cysts. Uh, currently, and this is taking a wider view of what regenerative medicine really means, uh, there are a lot of experiments going on on how you can re actually direct specific therapies to the cystic kidney. Uh, Folate, which is the vitamin, has a receptor on cells so that the cells can take up folate. Uh, they need it uh, for their metabolism. And this is a way to target um, drugs attached to the folate uh, molecule that will be taken up into the kidney specifically. Um, also, there's an immunoglobulin. Uh, they have letters after them. There's immunoglobulin G. Uh, there's also immunoglobulin A and you can weaponize IgA by adding a drug just like to the folate molecule and this also can be specifically taken up into the cyst and the hope is that these drugs delivered just to the cyst won't be toxic to the rest of the body and they may be able to correct the cyst and if that's the case that would be a form of regenerative medicine in that the structure of the kidney would revert to a more normal structure without these large cysts crushing adjacent nephrons. This is all in the future, however, but it's exciting. Moving on to uh, the new drug, uh, we have small molecule drugs, we have protein drugs, the biologics. We now are moving into the next generation of what can be considered drugs, and those are actually stem cells. So what if one could create a stem cell from a patient's own skin, and this can be done, and we are funding researchers here at the foundation uh, on just this sort of work. We can correct the gene, the mutant gene for PKD in that stem cell, and these could conceivably be injected into a patient. And while these cells would go everywhere, they would also go to the kidney. And it's been shown in rodents, at least, that when these types of stem cells go to a PKD kidney, that they actually improve the function of that kidney. So it's not completely regenerative, but it's certainly in the right direction. Another uh, approach is the exosome. We used to think exosomes, and this is how I was trained, uh, a long time ago, uh, that these were really little garbage bags. They're much smaller than the cell, and it turns out they're in your blood, they're in your urine, and they're not garbage. They're not carrying garbage. Actually, they're carrying polycystin-1, which is 
the protein that the PKD gene makes, and they also may be carrying the messenger RNA, in other words, the instructions for how to make polycystin-1. So one can develop exosomes that have the corrected polycystin, in other words, you correct the mutations so that the mRNA reads correctly, in other words, it has the right code for normal polycystin, not PKT mutated polycystin, and you can infuse these exosomes as drugs, just like you might infuse stem cells. And then we get on to maybe a little farther into the future, and that is actually growing with a patient's own tissues corrected for the mutation and making actual kidney organoids. Now this is in an earlier stage. Uh, somewhat functional organoids have actually been created, but they don't necessarily contain all of the parts of the kidney. In other words, they may not have a glomerulus, they may not have uh, a tubule that actually secretes the urine, and even if they did, where would they secrete that urine to? So there's work to be done there, but uh, five years ago, we wouldn't have uh, imagined that these kind of functional kidney organoids could even have been made. So a lot of progress occurs that can't be predicted, and that's the beauty of science. And then uh, on a more practical basis, and this has been going on for maybe five years or a little more, and that is the implantable non-immunologic hybrid kidney. Now what does that mean? For me, as uh, someone who has had a kidney transplant, as long as my transplant is viable, I'm taking uh, drugs that suppress my immune system. Now these drugs have gotten a lot better, and I'm obviously here um, working and speaking to you all, but I would much prefer to be in a situation where I didn't have to take those drugs. So I'll be talking a little bit more about what this means. Uh, going on to other regenerative medicine options before I get back to that hybrid artificial kidney is there are people actually working on humanizing pigs of all species and you can have a xenotypic transplant. So in other words, a genetically modified animal host that you can grow what is in essence a humanized kidney. Uh, that is long in the future, but uh, there is a lot of research in that arena. And then, obviously, we want to improve anti-rejection therapy. And uh, these are things that are going on today, increasing the proportion of potential donors that are a match, that will increase uh, the survival of transplants and reduce acute rejection. Uh, is this really regenerative medicine? Uh, in a sense it is because it allows a transplant not to be attacked by your immune system and all transplants are attacked to some extent. So this really is looking at keeping and replacing your renal function uh, with minimum intervention by toxic immunosuppressive drugs. And then we get into uh, the Star Trek type of science and that's nano-sized directed robots injected into your blood that could actually, in situ, meaning in the organ itself, actually repair structural anomalies. So exam for example, if you had a tubule that was blocked, conceivably you could have a little robot that had a little drill sized microscopically that could actually get rid of blocks in a kidney tubule or, for example, in a coronary artery to prevent a heart attack. Uh, you can also direct gene therapy uh, to specific organs, maybe via the exosomes that I just talked about, and we've talked about autologous stem cells. And the other exciting thing that's going on is making a synthetic organ scaffold. So what if you were able to take a kidney and remove all the cells but keep the connective tissue? because all of our organs are not just cells, they contain collagen, um, and this creates the scaffold for the kidney. 
and then you could populate that scaffold with normal cells rather than diseased cells and it would be possible then to take that autologous tissue and actually transplant it into the patient. So again, we're talking sort of Star Wars, but the reason that it's not is this type of research is actively going on and in some cases these types of experiments have actually been completed successfully in animals. So what about the implantable artificial kidney? Uh, this would have wide applicability to kidney diseases. It perhaps might even be better for other kidney diseases than PKD, and I'll get into that in a little bit, but it would still be a great advance. And the promise clearly is the avoidance of dialysis. Nobody wants to be on dialysis. And the pe reason people are on dialysis, for the most part, is there aren't enough kidneys for people who need kidneys. So the promise of an implantable artificial kidney is that there's only one human that's actually required, and that's the patient. So you don't need a living donor. You don't need a deceased donor. You just need this implantable artificial kidney. Yes, it will involve surgery. No, it will not completely replace all the functions of the native kidneys, but I know that all of you out there as PKD patients are well informed and able to assess the benefit and risks of uh, this type of advance. Uh, is it a cure? Uh, maybe, maybe not, but I think as this science matures, uh, if you can have an implantable kidney that does not require immunosuppression uh, and you're able to live a normal lifespan, I think we're getting close. The only reason I think that this is, has some peculiarities to PKD is even if you were to have an implantable artificial kidney, you would still have your 20 or 30 pounds of polycystic kidneys, and you would still have PKD, which affects other tissues uh, than just the kidney. So uh, for those of you who were at convention last summer, uh, this is a portrait of Dr. Shuvo Roy, and if he's, you see that slate blue container between his gloved hands, that is an implantable artificial kidney. And what's exciting about this kidney uh, is that it's not only artificial, but it contains human cells. But those human cells are protected from the immune system by the design of this device. So it doesn't even have to be the patient's own cells. They can be kidney cells cultured from someone else's kidneys or uh, perhaps um, even another species because the device is engineered so that the immune cells in your circulation don't see those other cells. And that's a key breakthrough. So if this is going to go on to be a successful innovation, one would be able to have this transplant. And if you look at it, it's really not much larger than a normal kidney. Uh, and you wouldn't have to take immunosuppressive drugs. Uh, I show on the left side of the picture, this was an X prize. Uh, I think um, some of the great innovators have offered this prize in many areas for truly innovative new science, and uh, what Dr. Roy is holding is truly innovative new science. Uh, so how would this kidney work? Uh, the great thing about it is it doesn't need a power source. Unlike artificial hearts, uh, they need a pump, they need electricity. Uh, this kidney would function solely on the movement of blood through uh, this device. And so there would be a filter side that keeps the formed elements of the blood, like your red blood cells, your white cells, and so forth, out of the device, but would allow your blood plasma, in other words, the non-cellular part of blood, into the device, and it would be filtered, removing toxins. And then that plasma would move through the cellular side the second stage of this device, 
and this would actually regulate your salt and water balance. That really can't be engineered artificially, so you need human cells. But as I mentioned, they'll be invisible to the immune system, so if this all works as designed, uh, you may not need any drugs uh, to have one of these implanted. And importantly, unlike the kidney organoids, which I mentioned earlier, uh, this device will actually have the equivalent of a ureter uh, that will empty into your own bladder so that the urine that this hybrid artificial kidney creates will be uh, removed from the body just as if it were a normal kidney. So uh, is this ready within the year? No. Uh, it will probably take many years to really test devices like these, but they are really much farther along uh, than they were five years ago. So there are major issues in PKD. How can regenerative medicine help? Well, uh, obviously an artificial kidney would probably correct your high blood pressure. Uh, you may be left with infection issues, uh, hard to say. Hematuria and retroperitoneal bleeds are still an issue unless you have a double nephrectomy, but electrolyte imbalance would be improved. Pain, both chronic and acute, uh, would potentially still be an issue because, again, you still have those large kidneys. But many of the other issues, the fatigue, sleep, and psychiatric disturbances, a lot of that would really be corrected. So the real uh, benefit is that end-stage renal disease does not happen, even though your native kidneys have failed with this hybrid artificial kidney, you can avoid dialysis and human transplant by getting this hybrid uh, device. Uh, getting back to regeneration, the planaria and to some extent the salamander tail is a pretty, are pretty simple, uh, but unlike the heart or the skin, even in mammals, the kidney is really complex. It has 35 or more different cell types. If you look at it, to me it's a beautiful structure. You can see on the outer surface the cortex, the inner medulla in yellow uh, are some of the fat cells that are associated with the kidney, the red artery going in, the blue vein going out, and the pale yellow ureter getting rid of the urine. So I think we've discussed a lot of the ways that we can restore kidney function that's lost during the progression of polycystic kidney disease. And so the question still remains, as it does for even more traditional drugs, would you want to replace the kidney early in the disease or later in the disease when you're closer to renal failure? And those will be addressed by, in part, physicians' best assessments of when it's the optimal time uh, to uh, intervene with regenerative medicine, whether it be a transplant or be exosomes or be stem cells. But uh, it is looking like there is promise to this approach. Uh, I think you know uh, most of what's on this slide. Uh, and I think regenerative medicine is going to address many of these issues. The cost of renal replacement therapy, not only for PKD, but for all kidney disease. Um, the regulatory path for an artificial kidney is going to be a tough one. Uh, but these types of issues are being worked on. So is the glass half empty or half full? I think it's more than half full uh, based on what I've seen in just the last five or so years. So ideally, regenerative medicine will prevent the onset of end-stage renal disease, not just for polycystic kidney disease patients, but for all chronic kidney disease patients and therefore eliminate the need for renal replacement therapy. Um, and by that I mean traditional dialysis or conventional human kidney transplant. But the kidney, other than the brain, is one of the most complex organs in the body. So <clears throat> 
whether the artificial kidney is ultimately going to be a success uh, is unclear, but all the other approaches that I mentioned, stem cells, exosomes, uh, are promising ways uh, that are inclusive of the title regenerative medicine um, that will get rid of some of the hindrances to developing new treatments for PKD and other renal diseases. The issue still remains all the pathways in the kidney. I said there are 35 plus cells. There's probably 10 times or 100 times that many pathways within those 35 different cells, all of which can be involved in disease. I obviously don't expect you to read this. I'm staring at the slide. I can barely read it. But this is what companies are dealing with. What do you put in an exosome? How do you program a stem cell? It's all related to all these mechanisms. So this type of research needs to go on as well. And this type of research may lead to drugs that mitigate the effects of PKD. They may not be called regenerative medicine therapeutics, but we have to be working not only on regenerative medicine, but also on therapeutics that are more traditionally drug-based. And it may be a combination of both regenerative medicine and pharmacology and pharmaceuticals uh, that provide uh, a high quality of life without fear of end-stage renal disease. So in conclusion, regenerative medicine offers the possibility of tubule regeneration and cell repair. I didn't talk much about tubule regeneration. That's, that's a tough one. But in the kidney organoids, uh, that have been created, there is some evidence that you can grow tubules. Uh, that's a start. It's not a whole nephron, but it's a start. And that research is also being funded by the foundation. There's also, and some of you may have seen these, they look like very complicated uh, inner tubes that you would wear to the beach. Uh, they're wearable kidneys, and the advantage is that your blood is being cleansed on a 24-7 basis, but quality of life would be uh, an issue. Uh, and it remains to be seen, A, whether they can be made to work uh, reliably, and B, is the quality of life uh, truly better than having to go in for dialysis three or four times a week. And then we've talked about the hybrid implantable kidneys, uh, that Dr. Roy and his colleagues at Vanderbilt are working on. Um, we'll see where this gets. And obviously, uh, if we see a lot of movement in this arena, you'll either hear from me or someone like Dr. Roy on advances being made in, in this arena. And as I mentioned before, this is probably applicable to you know, most chronic kidney diseases, and that really will free up a lot of Medicare funds that can be used uh, in much better ways. So the promise is avoidance of dialysis or human transplant where you need immunosuppression. And I know that at least in the PKD arena, we have well-informed patients that are able to assess the progress that's being made by physicians and scientists in regenerative medicine. And I think we'll even begin to see that other manifestations of PKD uh, that are common post-transplant may even be corrected by some of these stem cell therapies. So all in all, uh, I think the future is promising. We're seeing more companies than we used to interested in the PKD space. And we're seeing more clinical trials. So between uh, the science, uh, the future of that science, and the interest of pharma, both big and small, I think uh, things are, are looking up for uh, the eventual effective treatment of PKD. And with that, I'd be happy to answer your questions. And questions we have. Yeah. Um, so. Where to begin? So there are quite a few questions about the um, implantable artificial kidney. And I think one that was asked multiple times is, um, you know, if you've already had a transplant, 
or you're, you're sort of past that point, would this artificial kidney offer any benefit to you? Uh, I think that's a, a physician type question. If you have a, a well-functioning transplant, I would think you'd have to think hard about the benefit risk of yet another surgery. Uh, if you had a failing transplant, however, and a second human transplant was not possible, I certainly think that the hybrid artificial kidney is, is a, you know, assuming that it becomes uh, a producible product uh, is definitely an option. So then extending that, um, some people who have PKD maybe don't begin dialysis or don't have um, symptoms that will require a transplant until later in life, until so maybe 70, 75 years old. And we know um, if you're at that stage, it's a little more difficult or a lot more difficult to get um, to be eligible for a transplant. So would something like this artificial kidney be an option for a person like that? So that's a great question, and I think I may have answered it in code. Um, <laughs> obviously, kidneys, because they are such a precious commodity, uh, are allocated to younger patients where the lifespan of that transplanted kidney is going to be much longer. But it's also been shown that even people in their 70s benefit significantly from transplantation. It's just that they're not high on the list for kidneys. However, a hybrid implantable kidney, assuming you're healthy enough to undergo the surgery, uh, I think uh, could potentially be an alternative to the shortage of kidneys specifically for the elderly, but for everybody. Uh, even if you're young, uh, if you do not have a living donor, you may be on a list for many years. So yes, I think one of the great um, hopes for a implantable hybrid kidney is that it will relieve uh, the waiting time that patients undergo for not only a kidney, but a kidney that matches. So taking this to the next step, aside from the implantable kidney, if you've had a transplant, if you are maybe at an age where transplant, maybe you're of a, at a health level, you're not healthy enough to receive a transplant or have a surgery, would any of these other regenerative uh, medicine options, ideas that you've suggested be helpful to that group? So this is at a much earlier stage. I was really excited by an article that appeared in 2012. Uh, this was in a PKD rat model where cells and exosomes, both of which I talked about, were injected into a PKD rat and the cells and exosomes were from a normal rat. And the kidney function in those PKD rats actually improved, even though the scientists doing the study showed that these cells and exosomes didn't specifically go to the kidney. They went everywhere, but they didn't appear to have any toxic uh, effects, and kidney function was improved. Not replaced. It wasn't normal. But that, to me, means that there's some promise so that even if you're too old for a transplant or for whatever reason uh, surgery is not an option, it may well be, and this again is looking far into the future, that cell or exosome therapy may be applicable. Okay, so, um, and there, there are questions, there are quite a few questions about the artificial kidney, so I'll ask those, but just if you ask a question not related to that, I will make sure we get to those as well. So stick with us, but the, the largest volume are about this, this kidney, so we're going we're gonna to get through that first. Um, so, I mean, we don't really know details or, you know, when this might be available, right? Like, this is still in testing form. I know um, at convention this past summer, Dr. Roy did talk a little bit about clinical trials. Um, do, did he say, I don't remember, do you remember if he said when they're looking to do that? 
I think they're they're close. Uh, I don't have um, knowledge of when the first transplant, so to speak, is is scheduled. I assume there's a lot of discussion between uh, the universities and the FDA. Uh, much of this uh, has not appeared in the literature, so it's hard to say at what stage it is. Uh, but we will keep you updated as we find more about it. So I will say that someone who was at convention um, actually just popped in and said that uh, they thought he said the end of 2016 would be when they would be in clinical trials, and I don't, um, to my knowledge, they're not yet there. So obviously they were a little bit, uh, they're a little behind on that, but that's okay. We would rather than be on top of it and make sure that it's ready before it goes into a human. Yeah, and I would have to say that even with something like a simple drug, uh, delays are commonplace, unfortunately. Or fortunately, because when safety issues arise, you have to address them. So uh, I don't know that there are any uh, particular issues about this kidney other than uh, being first and uh, dealing with the regulatory authorities, uh, you probably can't pin down a date. But if he had said 2016, I wouldn't be surprised if we see some movement this year or next. Um, so someone is asking um, with the implantable kidney, um, what, they're saying, won't you still be left with minimal kidney function, maybe 5 to 10 percent, so you still have low energy, kind of the, the stage 5 CKD issues that you have anyway. So I'm, I'm not, I guess I didn't realize, or I should ask, are, are we looking at low kidney function with an implantable kidney, or are they hoping to make it better so that you have a more typical, helpful kidney function? So I wish I had Dr. Roy at my side. Don't we all? <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you're, you're absolutely correct that the problem with dialysis is that it really restores about 10 to 12 percent of normal kidney function. But you also have to remember that dialysis as a technology really hasn't changed a whole lot in probably the last 40 years. Um, the advance in this hybrid kidney is, yes, it's implantable, and that's a huge advance. But what's really important is unlike dialysis, it actually contains human kidney cells that do things that only living tissue can do. And that's where, for me, this is really exciting. That it's not just a mechanical device, it's a mechanical device with human cells that do things that just can't be engineered at this point. So I think the promise is that renal function would be better than dialysis. Okay. Um, let's see. So really, I mean, <coughs> pardon me, of course we all just want to know when this is going to happen, when we might get it. Um, we just, I mean, it's hard to say right now, once, you know, once it's in trials and it is, you know, if it goes well in human trials, then they still have to move along to FDA approval, things like that, right? So that takes more time. Yeah, so if one looks at, um, for example, artificial hearts, uh, you know, the first patient didn't survive very long. Uh, it takes a lot of experimenting tweaking the engineering, uh, learning how to connect um, a non-biological material with a biological material, such as the connection for the arterial blood going in and the connection for the venous blood going out and connecting a ureter and so forth. Uh, these are all things that uh, can only be learned about in trials, and obviously, just as with a small molecule drug, the FDA wants you to start out slow. So it will probably be 
one patient at a time in the very beginning. And if it proves to be tolerable and successful, then larger studies will certainly follow. Okay. And then someone's asking about um, like what would the surgery be like? Um, someone else is asking if filters would become clogged, would need to be replaced. And I think these are all questions that we just don't know yet. And that's why trials are important, especially these very small trials. Um, you know, so understanding, you know, how long, how long it will last, and all of those things. But we we don't know, right? Yeah. In term, if if you looked at it, uh, and it's not being really any larger than a regular kidney. I think the transplant surgery would probably be fairly similar to what's currently done with human kidneys. I mean, it's basically you have to connect the artery, the vein, the ureter, and uh, the device is small enough to fit in, into the ab abdomen or pelvis. Uh, the filter, I think, is designed not to be clogged because it is really allowing uh, flow without the types of materials that would clog it in the first place. Now, nobody can predict that. Uh, the other question is how long will the cells live in the cellular part of this apparatus? But there's no reason to think a priori that they won't do well because they'll be receiving oxygenated blood and nutrients just like the rest of the body does. So um, there, there's reason to be at least rationally optimistic about the potential for this to work, but uh, we've got to wait and see. And you actually answered a question before I even had to ask it about how long the cells would survive, so thanks. You're, we're, we're getting good at this, David. I don't even have to ask and you know what I'm going to say. Um, okay, moving away from the um, kidney, in, in implantable kidney for a bit, Someone is asking, with the IgA-targeted drugs, would that still leave giant holes that are non-functional where the cysts once were? Uh, good question. Um, one possibility is that the cysts might collapse depending on the therapeutic that's attached to the IgA molecule. Uh, it may cause them to reverse their polarity, in other words, instead of, instead of these cells secreting into the cyst and making them larger, that they, the fluid goes the other way into the, what's called the interstitium of the kidney, where it can be absorbed by blood vessels and the lymphatics, and uh, the kidney would actually get smaller. Uh, obviously, it depends on the type of drug that's attached. Uh, to IgA or to folate, uh, but the intention, I think, would be uh, to decrease the size of the kidney. Okay, so now, and I'm not sure I fully understand this question, but I'm sure you will. Um, if injected through IV, what percentage of exosomes or stem cells would be expected to reach the tubular epithelia? I think this was kind of back while you were talking about that? That's a great question. So the, the simplistic answer is with each heartbeat, uh, the kidneys are a huge consumer of blood. About 25% of the cardiac output goes through the kidneys. And if you think about it, that makes a lot of sense. So if you were to inject a therapeutic, um, let's talk about a small molecule. Uh, it's going to see the kidney. Uh, cells and exosomes are going to see the kidney as well. And to that extent, uh, injecting exosomes or cells are likely to get to the kidney. The real question is, and it, you asked it, is will it get to the tubule itself? Because the blood vessels are outside of the tubule. So do these stem cells migrate out from the uh, blood supply and populate the tubules? The rodent experiment I told you about earlier uh, suggests that that's possible. So uh, it remains to be seen how cells or exosomes might get from the blood supply of the kidney to the tubule side of the kidney. 
Okay. Um, I think actually I'm trying to make sure we've got, okay, here's one about, uh, we're still getting more about the artificial kidney, but I want to make sure we get the other questions answered as well. So, and I'm not familiar with a technique called origami assist in the region. So what, are you familiar with that technique? I used to do origami as a child. But. <laughs> um, we, we may have to do a little bit of research on origami assist in the regeneration process, um, or the person who asked that question, if you can offer a little bit more information. Um, but they're asking, with this technique or the method of 3D printing, connecting with tissue assist um, with replacement kidney, like, is that, and I think you did touch on that a little bit, is that something that might be helpful in this field? Yeah, so uh, we talked a little bit about uh, kidney organoids. Uh, 3D printing or providing a matrix for those organoids to sit in. Scaffold that you talked about. Mispronouncing it, giving it a New Jersey accent, organoid. <laughs> uh, we'll have to tell Dr. Friedman that and see what he says. <laughs> Yes, uh, 3D printing holds the promise for creating the right scaffold. So, uh, you know, building a kidney is complicated because I showed you that cross section of a kidney. Out in the cortex, the salt content is pretty much like your blood, but deep in the kidney, it gets very concentrated. So that scaffold requires a lot of deep thinkers on to how to get the right cells to go to the right place on that scaffold so that you can uh, have a functional kidney that's actually able to regulate the salt load in your blood. But great question. Yeah. Um, so would nanotechnology help with reducing the cysts. Could this nanotechnology transfer medication directly to the cells that are creating the cysts, or I will take it one step further to, even on a genetic level, to prevent the cysts from ever starting to begin with? Uh, so the probably what I came least prepared to talk about <laughs> is nanobots. But you uh, brought it up, I, so now we get to ask. I, I certainly, my expertise comes from movies. <laughs> about uh, nanotechnology. I think along with IgA and folate, uh, the, the big issue with nanotechnology, and really the IgA molecule was at a nanoscale anyway, uh, is how to target those, uh, you know, uh, nanobots or nanomachines to the kidney specifically. And I have the feeling that some of the same type of thinking that goes into using IgA as a delivery system or folate as a delivery system, that there will be other ways that nanotechnology or nano devices in the bloodstream can be directed to the kidney. But I'm, I wouldn't say we're talking science fiction because I don't think it's fiction, but we're certainly talking the future. Futuristic. Yeah. Um, okay. And this is a great question and I think something that um, will kind of help inform sort of a bigger picture thing. So I've had several questions about, you know, artificial kidney or some other um, method. Would you still need to keep your native cystic kidneys intact, even if you have an artificial kidney or if you're able to, um, you know, re re replace some other way or whatever? Um, and also, if you got that and you do get rid of your native kidneys, would that mean that you're done, you're cured of PKD? Well, um, I didn't stress uh, the systemic nature of polycystic kidney disease. Uh, in some ways, we do ourselves a disservice because everybody thinks immediately kidney. But even with a transplant, even with a hybrid implantable kidney, you still have PKD. That means that the mutation is basically in every cell in your body except perhaps red blood cells and platelets which don't have nuclei. So um, the other issue with the first generation of hybrid implantable kidneys, I have the feeling, is that cells in the kidney produce erythropoietin, which is a hormone 
that tells your bone marrow to make red blood cells. And I have the feeling that in the first generation model, the cells that are helping your salt balance may not be the same cells that are producing erythropoietin. So that these hybrid implantable kidneys will not replicate one for one every function of the kidneys. The kidneys do a lot of things, a lot of subtle things, and uh, those will have to be dealt with. And some of the non-renal issues about PKD will still continue to be an issue for the patient, but clearly the kidney uh, and replacing kidney function is the most important goal. Okay, um, so it is almost time. Um, I think, I mean, let's see, one, we've, you know, even if I didn't ask your question directly, I, I believe I've asked all questions in some way, so you should have gotten the information. Um, so, okay, one thing that I just, I've heard you talk about a lot, so I think will be an interesting final question. Um, if you are, uh, how do you say this, situs inversus totalis, how will that affect any of these things that you've discussed? So uh, obviously uh, the connection of situs inversus uh, is a ciliopathy, and I've used that term in, in prior webinars, uh, in that the mutation in polycystic kidney disease also creates a ciliopathy. Uh, one of the great mysteries is that although PKD is by far the most common ciliopathy, there are many, many ciliopathies such as situs inversus, and this is related to the uh, malfunction of cilia in a very special place in the embryo when the embryo is still symmetric. It's the flow around these cilia that tells the growing embryo what's to be on the right side, what's to be on the left side, and somehow a mutation uh, in a ciliary protein causes this type of problem. Uh, so that's the connection, but clearly uh, people with situs inversus may have normal kidney function. Uh, so that not all ciliopathies are the same. Okay. I think that's all the time we have. It's 1 o'clock. Um, if, if there is something that we didn't touch on that you're still curious about, feel free to email me at research at pkdcure.org or alexis, A-L-E-X-I-S, D as in dog, at pkdcure.org. I get both of those. Um, uh, and with that, I think... Well, I have one, one last comment, I think. Okay. Um, I just cut Alexis off. That's okay. I, I, was, I was reading to make sure I didn't miss anything <laughs> on my script, so go ahead. I, I just wanted to say that I, I recognize the excitement about hybrid implantable kidneys, but I, I would like to say that, you know, the foundation and the academic uh, research community recognizes that solutions will also require therapeutics, drugs, exosomes, stem cells, uh, that we are not at the point that the hybrid implantable kidney is a cure-all. Uh, and I guess uh, I'm using the phrase cure-all in multiple ways. So it's very exciting. It's going to be a game changer, as Mayo has said about regenerative medicine, but we need to attack this disease on all fronts. Absolutely, and I will follow that up by saying that um, some of our current research that we fund, especially the work that Dr. Benjamin Friedman is doing um, and others are uh, sort of along this line and it, taking the first steps into this area. So just be sure to stay in tune with what we're doing. Support us if you're able um, through gifts to the foundation um, and definitely uh, stay tuned because every every month, every year that goes by, we're going to get closer to these kinds of things and also drug therapies. Um, so we, we look forward to talking with you more in the future. Um, everyone saying thank you um, and happy kidneyversary to Karen who just told us that today is her sixth transplant kidney anniversary. So happy kidneyversary to you.
And with that, thank you so much for participating in our webinar. Thank you, David, for this really interesting and important topic. Um, let us know if you have any questions. We will send you an email later this week or early next with a link directly to this talk. We did record it, so if you want to send it out to family members, we'll send you that link in an email and also a survey, so please be sure to fill out that survey. Let us know what you think and if there are topics that you want to hear about in the future. Uh, have a great day, everyone, uh, and we'll talk to you next month.